So I'm going to talk mainly about the I series, uh, two of which you've got in the collection at Leamington, and to talk a little bit about um, after image, which is uh, was the kind of impetus for I. And then I'm going to end by talking about a view from inside from 2012, which is a series of portraits I did with people with uh, who experienced psychosis. So I'll share my screen um, and start. Oops. Ah. Sorry. Okay. okay, hopefully you can see that full screen. Um, so after image was enabled by one of the first SIARP commissions from the Wellcome Trust in 1996 to 7. Um, and at the time I was interested in exploring the relationship between the brain and the body. Um, that's sort of where it started from. Um, I'd heard that, I'd read that uh, it's possible to experience a phantom of a limb that you've, ne you've never had. And that seemed to imply all sorts of interesting things about the brain-body relationship. So um, I sought out neuropsychologist Peter Halligan and, uh, sorry, neuropsychologist John Q and neurologist Peter Halligan. And we had a couple of long meetings. Um, and after that, I worked with these eight people um, all of whom have had limbs amputated and experienced phantoms um, related to those limbs. So first of all, I'll just show you two people here. Um, first of all, I uh, photographed everybody. I made a straight portrait of people in their living room. So here's Roger, as he wished to be photographed without his prosthesis. And this is Jackie um, in her living room with her prosthesis. So just straight. Uh, photographs. Then after a long period of discussion with each person and bringing uh, rough images back to them, um, we came up with this series of uh, these photographs, these portraits, um, this one of Roger, which depicts the hand that he experiences but that you and I would not normally see. Um, so for me the process this project and the process of working with these people um, was really interesting because it was about looking at someone's subjective experience as opposed to other people's perceptions of them. Um, and there's always a narrative in the phantom. Um, Jackie here, her phantom appears to be quite an unusual shape um, because she lost her hand in a car accident. The hand was sewn back on again and then had to be re-amputated because it did the um, reconnection didn't work. So you can see in the shape of the phantom, there's a kind of memory of the events that happened. Um, and the phantoms, people's phantoms, people talk about phantom limbs being imaginary, but actually um, we were filming with Channel 4 at Jackie's house at one point, and somebody went to, she was sitting in the chair like this, and somebody went to sit on the arm of the chair where her hand is, and she drew her arm away very quickly. So um, <clears throat> that really proves, or proved to me at the time, the, um, the reality of, of the phantom for somebody. Whilst we were um, working on this project, I was made aware several times of how, and this was the mid-1990s, how people, even with acquired disabilities, were, being, were feeling that um, they were being treated as somehow not quite fully human um, because a part of their body was missing. And I found this kind of really emotive and it stuck with me and I wanted to make some work that would challenge people's attitudes towards physical difference, um, which is where I comes in. Uh, this is the first in the I series. Um, it's the last talk in the series was um, by Catherine Long. It was a conversation between artists Catherine Long and Luke Pell. Um, and Catherine is the one who lent me her shoulder for this uh, photograph, I won. Um, and whilst Catherine was very supportive of the project, she was also very rigorous and particular about how um, the image containing her shoulder should look. So I think that's possibly one of the reasons why this is my favourite image in the series. Maybe that and the kind of accidental reflection that um, ended up of the... Uh, 
of the white statue in the window. <clears throat> and that happened because we were, I was working with a friend who was helping me um, actually take the photographs. And it took us all day to make this one. So it was pretty dark by the, by the end of the, the day. Um, and so that reflection appeared there. Um, oh, 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 okay, sorry, I forgot. I wanted to um, just wait for that person to come in. Um, I wanted to just flick through the series. I don't know whether those of you who are watching are familiar um, with this work or not, but if you're not, I'd like you to just take notice of your own reactions as I flick through the whole series. Perhaps think about where you're looking and what you're seeing and maybe how you feel about it too. I'll talk to individual images in a moment. Um, so, as I said, this was ended up being the first image in the series. Um, and people don't necessarily notice there's a difference. The body has a difference. Um, when my mum first saw this, she just said, this is a lovely portrait of you, dear. Um, and I guess she thought I had my hand behind my back, my arm behind my back. Um, so this is kind of drawing, the idea is that, that the image is drawing people in. Um, sorry, and then we go on to the second one. Um, <coughs> this, I've included this slide, these are actually kind of never before seen images. Um, they're part of the working process. The image on the left, um, is something that happened early in the process. First of all, when I first conceived of this work, I was thinking of using um, recognizable celebrities or models um, so as to kind of disrupt that process of looking. But obviously that became, very quickly it became obvious that um, that wasn't practical. So I realized I had to use myself, which I wasn't very keen about at the beginning. But actually that then became a really powerful aspect of the work for me. And um, another thing I set out to do at the beginning was to keep things simple, because my work always tends to become very complicated, um, or the process of making it becomes very complicated. Um, so I thought, okay, we'll shoot the figures in a studio, white background, very simple. But immediately, as soon as I started doing that and, and composing a, a figure, it was clear that that just wasn't going to work. Um, there's nothing there as a counterpoint to the unusual body, to the bodily differences. Um, so I went out looking for ornate chairs to sit the figures on um, because I thought that would act as some kind of um, visual foil for the images. And in doing so, I came across this wonderful setting, Hospital Field House, um, up on the north coast of Scotland. I should have said I, may, I was making this work during a residency at Napier University in Edinburgh. Um, so I was up in Scotland already. And uh, the people at Hospital Field, I think they have a lot of artist residencies there now, but at the time um, they had musical events and different things. Um, anyway, they allowed me to photograph there. So I and a friend went and took our equipment um, did the shoots there but before that um, I just took a little digital camera and took lots of snapshots um, because at the first I was just looking for chairs uh, so lots of snapshots and I took them back and started trying to photoshop myself and um, some different body parts onto me um, and then I realized actually it's not just about the chairs it's about the environment the whole environment is really interesting um, so that led us to actually go and work at hospital field 
And the image on the right here is um, one of the base images or the base image for the, the second portrait. <coughs> um, I photographed myself in the settings, um, but it was very difficult for some of the, physically difficult for some of the people who contributed to the images um, to be photographed at all, let alone to travel to um, the hospital field. So I photographed other people in their own homes or <clears throat> wherever was convenient for them um, and myself in the actual setting. Um, and sometimes it was quite a challenge to kind of match the, the images. But here's the finished work um, from that buff. As I was making the work, I didn't really realise um, all the correspondences that were going on between the bodies that I was constructing and um, the f images of figures in the backgrounds. So this one, there's quite a clear correspondence in the pose between the figure um, with my head on it and um, the, painting, the woman in the painting. Um, that was, I can't say it's an accident, it must have been a decision, but it wasn't a conscious decision at the time. Um, so each of the figures has a different uh, ratio of me and the other person. In the first image, obviously it's just Catherine's shoulder and the rest of the body is me. Here, it's my head and neck and the rest of the body um, belongs to someone else. Here it's all me apart from the arms. Um, when I was trying to recruit people for the work for the project, I did, um, I approached a lot of organisations as well as some individuals and it was very difficult to explain to people um, what I was trying to do. You know, I want to photograph people's disabilities and not their identities. It seems um, a bit of a dodgy thing to do. But uh, the woman who contributed her arms to this image, uh, Simone, was very kindly trusted me from the outset. Um, and I went and went to her home and photographed her, her arms and hands. Um, and as soon as I was able to make a rough of this image and show it to people, it was very much easier to explain what I was trying to do. Um, so she really helped the process along. Um, here, another correspondence between, I think this time it was a little more conscious, um, between the white figure and the body. And here, um, the torso of someone who very generously lent me um, her image because it was extremely difficult and uncomfortable for her to be photographed, but she was keen to do it. And I must say that um, there is an ethical process to this. Um, as I'm making the images, I talk to people um, and everybody gets uh, a copy of the image, with, in this case, with their body parts in it. Um, and everybody has to agree to um, the image and, and kind of sign it off before I exhibit it publicly. So the work was, as I said, made in Edinburgh. Um, and there was a wonderful photography gallery in Edinburgh at the time called Portfolio, which is sadly no longer there. Um, it was first exhibited there and was also published in Portfolio magazine, along with a really brilliant essay by the cultural theorist Mark Cousins. I'll just read you um, a little bit of the essay. The portrait is not just of someone, it needs someone. It needs a particular type of spectator, one who repeats the same idealization of the body that the setting has demanded. In this sense, we've all experienced a sense of exclusion from certain images. It's not so much that we simply dislike an image, but that we can sense that this or that image doesn't want us. In extreme cases, we can feel excluded or disliked by an image. The mechanism of this strange process can be described in terms of our unwillingness or our incapacity to identify with the body, which the image demands that we present to it. Normally, this process is unconscious, but by dis di disrupting the process here, these images begin to show us the nature and power of that process. And I really loved, this is just a small excerpt from a much longer essay, um, and I really loved that Mark Cousins absolutely got what I was trying to do with this work. 
it was, it's not, or rather, the idea is in, in um, attaching my head to uh, or different people's bodies or attaching different people's body parts to my identity. Um, the idea is that maybe people realise as they look at the work or maybe they don't, um, that all the figures have the same facial identity except for one, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the aim of that is um, to make people realise that actually they're not looking at someone's identity when they're looking at a different body. They're looking at the disability or the physical difference. Um, so I wanted this work to act kind of like a mirror um, for people to see their own responses and reflect on their own processes. Um, and, but as I said, this last image, I intended that all of them should have the same facial identity, i.e. mine. Um, but then, it's a long time ago, I can't quite remember how now, but um, I came into contact with this young woman with Down syndrome and realised that actually people whose facial appearance is um, affected by Downs, there's so much um, kind of negative response and reaction to them that I, I thought it would actually be really important to um, incorporate um, this person's face and head into the work. So this image is all my body except for the head and face. Um, and again, ethically, um, she agreed to this and her parents agreed. Um, so I would never do anything without people's um, proper consent. So uh, that's I, that's the series. Um, I'm going to probably rather rapidly move on now. Um, to talk about a much later work, but a work which sort of deals with some of the same issues, um, but in relation to mental health. Um, this is a view from inside from 2011 to 12. Um, I was thinking about, I mean, by this time, I mean, people like Catherine may disagree with me slightly here, but I think that we've come a long way since the 1990s in terms of how we understand <coughs> physical difference and how people relate to that. But mental health is still something that is um, very stigmatized. And thinking back to I, I wanted to kind of transport some of the thinking behind that um, and apply it to mental health. And because the settings became so important in I, um, the rather grand historic settings that took the figures out of the here and now um, and into a more sort of universal kind of setting, I wanted to apply that to these, this work as well, perhaps in a more deliberate sort of self-conscious kind of way. Um, so at the beginning of the project, I've, I've worked here with uh, 10 different people who experienced psychosis. And at the beginning of the project, I went around to a lot, a lot, a lot of different um, National Trust and English heritage properties. And in the end, decided that um, 18, to focus on 18th century settings, partly because the 18th century was the age of reason. Um, there's so much symmetry um, and they're sort of cool interiors. Um, and he used these interiors as stage sets, in a sense, into which to bring um, lots of elements that are relevant to each person when they're not in consensual reality. Um, so I worked for a period of nine to 12 months with each person. Um, we spent a lot of time talking and looking at images at the beginning. Um, people told me their stories, told me the stories of what their reality is like when they're not in consensual reality, when they're in psychosis. Um, and together we came up with a sort of vocabulary of images that I then put together and then brought back to each person. Um, and we refined the image and then eventually um, we undertook this uh, this, uh, photo shoot together. So this time I did bring each person into the uh, historic setting. So this is Beth at Clandon, ha Clandon Park um, in uh, 
in Surrey, um, which I don't know if you saw in the news, a few years subsequently burnt down very sadly because it was such a beautiful building. Um, anyway, so the setting was there. Um, obviously, the fox, the crow, the tea set um, were all introduced. And those images in the frames at the back, uh, the black and white ones, the sepia ones, are all Beth's family members who were very uh, significant in her psychotic experience, as were Adam and Eve. Um, each photograph has a window in it. Um, when I was working with people in the production process, I showed each, one, each person an image of a room um, with a window and asked them when they're not well, what should be inside the room and what should be outside. And people had very different and very interesting responses to that. Um, for several people, the outside was threatening or bleak, like Beth here with the car park. Um, and for, or for others, it was um, kind of celebratory outside and the in interior was threatening. Um, so that to me, the idea of these two different spaces was kind of interesting. Um, so to move on to Julia, um, her reality when in psychosis is, was, as she described it, quite celebratory, quite high energy. Um, and there's a whole, again, a whole narrative here that actually only she really knows. And um, to me, this was interesting that I would work together to, with someone and we would tell their story visually, but it's nothing like as explicit as if you tell the story in words. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the narrative is there for that person and it's kind of externalizing their experience, but, um, but that narrative is, in some sense, is quite private. Um, this next slide is just here to reveal something again of the working process. So this is, was one of the many very rough sketches that I made um, of Julia. Her portrait was shot at the Foundling Museum. I don't know if you've ever visited there. This is a little bit more like it actually looks. Um, so we um, shot in a couple of different rooms and I altered the setting to kind of conform more to the atmosphere um, that Julia wanted for her portrait. Uh, this one, Chatu's experience was all about the media and um, <clears throat> a lot of different realities all going on at once. It's actually perhaps my least favourite image. I struggled with it a bit, I, and simply because I think the screen should all be much bigger. Um, I left them at life size. But for him, there were yeah, just all these different <clears throat> spaces in, in one room. Several people I worked with um, would hear voices, and that was obviously very difficult to visualize. Um, but here, the kind of gargoyle creatures sticking out of the uh, picture frames and the graffiti on the wall were attempts to represent, um, if not, well, you can't make an image of a voice, but represent the feeling um, that Ther Teresa has of, of the voices, which are quite aggressive and intrusive. And for her, the outside, you can see it's just calm sea. So for her, the exterior um, was a calm, uh, reassuring space, whereas inside was much more um, chaotic and difficult. Here, I don't know if you can tell, but these are porn magazines and a Bible. Um, so for Dennis, the um, we were representing a kind of good and evil, a sort of archetypal battle between good and evil. And yes, that's him looking at it to himself. Um, another one, Lucinda, the stones were very important for her. Again, outside is calm and beautiful, but you can see the windows are shattered. Um, and she talked about these stones coming through the windows. Uh, this was a rough that I made for, of her and she actually became quite angry with me because <laughs> the stones were in the wrong place and they were too big. So um, we worked together to alter the image and uh, reduce the size of the stones. Right, 
Um, for Amanda, uh, she has intermittently um, physical health problems as well as mental health problems, which is why the uh, wheelchair is there. And she talked about how much easier it is to cope with physical difficulties because they're visible and obvious, whereas mental health difficulties are often not visible to, to the outside world. Um, some of the experiences were quite dark and difficult. Um, this again is somebody who really invested in her image. She actually supplied me with the image of the light outside the window, um, which she felt was really important to have there is this kind of, again, dark, intrusive space outside. And then lastly, again, it's like feeling of paranoia with people looking in through the window and the dark figure in the mirror, which was very significant to her, as well as the wolf, which uh, posed some problems bringing into the uh, National Trust house. 